to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundram and with my co-host Ashley Case, we will be sitting down with our industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Tara Kawaki. Tara is the manager of global sales proposals for Blackline, a publicly traded software as a service company where she leads a team of proposal professionals to execute highly technical responses for ITQs, RFPs, RFIs, etc. The vast majority of their work falls in the B2B space, but Tara lived in the SLED world for years in previous roles, so she is well versed in the nuances of different types of companies, industries, understanding the challenges that arise as technology advances. She prides herself on leading a team of individuals with a can-do attitude who ensure all deadlines are met, all internal clients around the world are happy, and that they're all utilized in the resources at their disposal to get the job done. Well, Tara has been in the proposal industry for over 10 years and is an active member of APMP's California chapter where she sits on the board as director of events. Her term began just as COVID was sweeping the world. So in little gathering at an in-person event, she has been hosting monthly West Coast Coffee Roast on the third of third Thursday of every month on a range of topics. All are welcome to join. Prior to her time in California, she was a member of Greater Midwest Chapter and is looking forward to seeing her proposal friends in Denver, as well as hoping, uh, as well as helping to host the California's chapter's annual training day also this fall at Disneyland. She obtained her foundation certification in 2017 and was named as APMP's 40 and 40 in 2018. Over the past several years, she has enjoyed being an active participant in the California Mentorship Program, both as a mentor and a mentee, and is currently studying for the practitioner exam that she hopes to pass later this summer. While in college, Tara earned her Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from St. Cloud State University, and was a legislative intern at the Minnesota Senate during the same time frame that Jesse the Body Ventura was governor. Ooh. Early in her career, Tara was a paralegal for a number of years at some of the top firms in the country, where she was affectionately nicknamed Tara Legal. <laughs> That's a nice name, Tara. Welcome to Scribble Talk. Great to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome, Tara. Tara, where were you born? And let's talk about your high school and education. Sure. So I was born in um, a suburb of Minneapolis, a very tiny town called Farmington, and it's about uh, 45 minutes from from Minneapolis. And I uh, bounced around a little bit uh, as a kid as far as where I lived, um, including, you know, three three years stint in Southern California. I started high school in Dallas and then moved back to uh, Minnesota for the rest of high school and college. Wow. Any, any memorable childhood memories that comes to your mind during your time at Minnesota? Oh, yeah. I mean, we would go to family cabins uh, every summer to go fishing and just hang out with the cousins. I have a, I have a huge family. So, uh, you know, a lot of times we'd hang out on Fridays for fish fries and <laughs> always uh, around, around family growing up. So that was fun. I have a lot of cousins that are close in age and um, siblings and all that. So I had a lot of fun Minnesota summers because yeah. summers only last about two weeks. So no, I'm just oh, Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. So from, from there, high school and education, uh, is there any role that you took before you started at uh, Bachelor of Arts in St. Cloud? Oh yeah. I've been working solidly since I was 15. Um, mm-hmm first job ever in life was in Texas. Uh, we lived just north of Dallas and I worked at a Kroger grocery store and was uh, a clerk there uh, and, uh, you know, a bag girl. And then even before college, I worked as a waitress. I worked, um, what else did I do? I worked at, um, at a, at a gym. And I was like the check-in girl, you know, kind of thing. And I always, my sister and I had a babysitting company since we were little. Oh. Uh, and we, we named it, she, her name is Tracy and I'm Tara. Right. So we were TNT babysitting. We care when you're not there. <laughs> so that was our first <laughs> life. Um, so yeah, I've always kind of been a hard worker. Uh, even through college, I had uh, multiple jobs waiting tables, you know, interning. And I worked as a government documents librarian uh, in the, in the college library and Mm. always, always up to something. 
audit? And at what point were you there at, as a legislative intern at the Minnesota Senate? Yeah, it was an interesting time to be there because, uh, so um, Al Franken, who was on Saturday Night Live, uh, you know, and he was in the news a few years ago for some not great things, but he was he was there during that time. And then uh, Jesse, Jesse Ventura, who was, you know, a professional wrestler, was elected to governor as an independent, which is super rare to, to hear of. And this was kind of before Arnold Schwarzenegger and Donald Trump and other, you know, everyday folks were elected to office. So he was one of the first. Um, but interestingly enough, one of his first uh, executive actions was to raise the tuition uh, of college students by 6% across the state. And it was ironic because that was the majority of his vote was the 19 to 25 year old vote. So he, uh, people weren't very uh, happy with, with their decision there. So, but it was a fun time to work there and uh, got to learn a lot. Wow. And from then on, is that what took you to spending a number of years at being in a paralegal? Yeah. So I decided to move to New York after college and I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to go to law school uh, and, and spend that time in commitment. So I thought what better way to get a feel for it than to work at a law firm. Right. So, um, you know, got a job at a large firm in midtown Manhattan and worked, yeah, as a litigation paralegal for a number of years where I got my nickname, um, which everyone thought was so funny. And to this day, sometimes, I, you know, I'm still in touch with a lot of the people I worked with and they still call me that. It's very funny. And then I, so I was there for about four years and then I moved to Chicago uh, in 2006 and was still doing the paralegal thing for a number of years and then segued into electronic discovery which is just, you know, document forensics for law firms because it was a natural progression. And that in turn, somebody recruited me to do RFPs for, for e-discovery, right? So I kid you not, I was on the phone with a recruiter and he, he said, I remember you told me once that you enjoy writing and you like to write as a, as a profession. And I'm like, yep, where are we going with this, right? And he said, how about being an RFP writer for an e-discovery role. And I am on the other line, Googling RFP. I had never heard of an RFP. This was, you know, 11, 12 years ago. And I'm like, well, I could probably do this. And he's like, it's, you know, they'll teach you on the job. And, you know, as a proposal writer, as I'm sure, you know, once you have that skill set, it's very transferable from industry to industry. Right. So started any discovery, which was a, a background I knew. Uh, and then I've worked in several industries since that. And it's just a, you know, it's a little bit of a learning curve to, to learn a new industry, but once you have that proposal, basic skill set, uh, it, you know, it's good. And, and I'm, I'm so thankful for that first role because they taught me in what I say is like the right way, right? Like they taught me all about colored team proposals and the different reviews and, you know, all best practices. Um, whereas some of the other places I've worked has, have been a little more loosey goosey with their process. I at least know from a background of like what it should look like and what a well-run proposal team uh, can, can be. Long answer there, sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, like it, it just tells you, you know, how far you are coming. And it's always nice to hear people's journey, how they enter the proposal world. So from yeah. that point onwards, you have been in the proposal industry. Um, right. Any any uh, memorable proposal effort? What was your very first proposal? And is there any other memorable proposal that you can think of, Tara? Oh, man, I, I can't say that I remember my first one, but I remember one that is kind of uh, an interesting tale in that, it was uh, for, a, I used to work for a company that they did uh, collections um, for the top 400 biggest colleges and universities. We would bid on that debt and, and, and try to win the bid, right? So there was a college in Texas and in these industries, like everything was paper back then, like, you know, seven copies, double-sided on post-recycled paper, this, that, and the other. So, you know, I learned, I learned a lesson on how to utilize FedEx the best way when we had this bid due in Texas at a college. Uh, let's say it was on a Thursday, right? We sent it on, on the Wednesday overnight, which again, we'll never do. You always send it two days in advance in case something happens. And there was a fire at the FedEx facility that oh. it was, and it did make it to the destination in time the next day, but it was time stamped. So it got there, let's say at like 11 AM. But then by the time it got into procurement's hands at 3.30, it was time stamped in their office at 3.30. So even though it had arrived to its correct destination, the timestamp said 3.30, it was due at three. So they rejected the bid saying it was late. And then, and, and so you can imagine the fallout from that. The salespeople were upset. You know, why didn't you send this in two days before? And I, I really had no answers for them other than like, 
obviously I couldn't help that there was a fire at the facility and all these, these other things happened. But I kid you not, two weeks later, they declared that all the bids that they had received in time were insufficient. So they canceled the bid, re-put re it out there into the world. And we basically submitted our same proposal and we ended up winning. Wow. <laughs> so again, lesson learned. You always send things in two days in advance because then if something happens, you can always mail it again the next day if need be, print out another copy or whatever. But um, yeah, luckily in my current role, we have in the two years that I've been here, we've submitted approximately one paper bed. <laughs> so I do not miss those days. Got it, Sarah. It's like, you know, how, how things have changed drastically, right? In this yeah. past five years. So that's great. So talk us through about your team at Blackline and uh, what sort of work they, does your team do? Sure. So I oversee a team of four other individuals. We all sit in California in the Los Angeles area. And, uh, you know, we're hoping eventually to, to broaden our team because we do support um, hundreds of reps, uh, sales reps globally, including uh, the DOC region, EMEA, APAC, uh, you know, all of it. The Nordic region, we're breaking into South America a little bit more, definitely have um, all of North America covered. Uh, that said, we, we bid on things that, so, so basically the way we get our, our assignments, I, I've been in roles where we were the ones pounding the pavement, trying to find the opportunities. This, this role, luckily, I don't have to do any of that. They all come to us through the salespeople. And I am a working manager, right? So uh, a small percentage of the, the bids I all assign to myself. Uh, we, all, we, we do RFPs, RFIs. And then interestingly enough, our entire team does the ITQs, the information technology questionnaires for the entire company. So where that might typically fall to InfoSec or other groups at other companies, we handle all that on our end. And that's probably about 70% of what we do. So it was a quick trial by fire to really get up to speed in uh, the financial and accounting universe, uh, which I didn't have much exposure to prior to this role. But again, like I said earlier, once you have that proposal skill set, it's very transferable from industry to industry. So uh, now I'm your girl to talk all about uh, <laughs> finance and accounting automation. And uh, we... Yeah, so we, we have a very high volume of what we do. We've already done uh, over 500 responses this year. But we also count uh, one-off emails. Like if, if we've submitted something and the client comes back or the prospect comes back with clarifying questions, we ask them to uh, open a new request with us so that we're tracking um, each touch point throughout the, throughout the process. And then we're not super client-facing. We consider our reps our internal clients and uh, we, the way that I manage my team too, is that we have kind of a second set of eyes policy, right? So once I've assigned it to one of my guys, they go through the whole process. They lead the kickoff calls. I'm called in as necessary. And at the end, uh, I always review what they've done so that I can make any edits or changes just like they, they review mine as well. So yeah, it's a pretty solid team. And, uh, two of our people have been around for over seven years, which is kind of unheard of in the proposal world. So uh, we have great experience all around. Brilliant, Tara, brilliant. Looks like a great team out there. So Tara, I think, um, you know, from, from starting as, you know, doing, taking multiple roles to university, even starting your own company with your sister, uh, babysitting there all the way to become Tara Legal and from there to uh, <laughs> Blackline and other things you've come so far. At what point in your career did you come across APMP as an industry body and talk us through your association with the California chapter as well? Sure. So I would say I had been doing proposals for probably three years before I had ever even heard of APMP. And so I was, you know, I wouldn't say I was very involved in the Midwest chapter, but I was a member and I had gone to a couple of the conferences and then, you know, I kind of fell away from it for a year or two. And so at the San Diego uh, Bid and Proposal Con several years ago, it was a month before I was moving to California, and I, I just wanted to double down and get back into APMP in a big way. So I decided to reach out to people in that California chapter to say, hey, can I meet you guys at the conference? I'm going to be there in a month. I'm transferring chapters. Uh, what can we do? And uh, Heather Kirkpatrick, who a lot of people know in the proposal industry, uh, she was, you know, she has just so much life and energy and she took me under her wing. We became fast friends. She's still to this day, like one of my dearest friends. 
And I met Dick Esam, who affectionately known as Word Man around uh, the APMP and proposal world. He became my mentor right away. And they were, the two of them were just instrumental in, in launching me into the California chapter where I uh, quickly got my foundation certification within a few months of moving to California. And then they collectively nominated me for the 40 under 40 the following year, which I, I, I joke that it was my last year of eligibility. So if it wasn't going to work that year, then I, I was out of the running forever. Uh, so I did get it the, you know, months before turning 40. And it was, you know, it was kind of special because it was in Florida where it was the last bid and proposal con that we've had, you know, because it was canceled last year. So we, we wouldn't have known that that was the case at the time. Right. So I always encourage people to, you know, despite the fact that I'm still about to take my practitioner, I, I encourage people to go for it. I think we doubt ourselves a lot. And, you know, it's like, I often find this is my analogy is that like, you know, if there's 10, just 10 bullet points on a job description, sometimes women, especially will say, you know what, I only meet seven of those. I'm going to have to not apply for this job. Whereas I find, and this is not to uh, ruffle any feathers, but sometimes men might only meet three or four of the criteria and they're like, you know what, I'm just going to go for it. Right. So I truly believe in mentorship and helping other women, helping other people, but especially women uh, go for what they need in this world, especially in the business world, because if you don't, no one else is going to do it for you. And, and you might not have the kind of champions that, that you're looking for. And so it, it's nice to like, feel welcome and feel like you belong and feel like you deserve all the accolades and, and whatever else is out there waiting for you. So yeah, uh, that's kind of my involvement with APMP California. And then uh, just before uh, the pandemic hit last year, I was nominated or I was uh, elected to be the events chair. Like I love planning parties. I've done a lot for the nonprofit world, a uh, lot for my son's school and, and things like this over the last you know 15 years and been on different committees at, at jobs I've worked at. And so it was a natural fit for me. But then, you know, how do you lead events when you can't have any, right? So after, you know, canceling the ones that we had set up and happy hours and whatnot. Um, and I was really looking forward to it because we were going to do one in San Francisco, one in San Diego, one in LA so that we could kind of cross the state and get our members all, you know, engaged again. Uh, so then after a few months, we um, tailing on the Liberty chapter that I heard they do these monthly coffee things that they've been doing way before COVID hit. Uh, I, you know, tried to get a little more information on that. And we've been hosting these West Coast coffee roasts uh, for the last 10 months or so. And I think it's going to go on in perpetuity after, after, you know, the world starts going back to normal in tandem with in-person events. So it's been fun. It's, it's, uh, we have different topics every month. We even did like a mindfulness session at the beginning of the, the year where uh, we had a, like a certified yoga instructor come in and lead us through some breathing exercises and, and things we can do at our own chair. And so it's not always proposal focused, but it, I've been having a lot of fun with it. That's really great, Tara. I mean, like, you know, with your personality, definitely, I think there is a lot of energy. And with you, uh, Dick, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody in the team, my God, Heather and others, you know, it's a, it's a good chapter to be. And anybody who's look, considering um, an energetic chapter, one of the chapters I love is uh, the California chapter. So good, good for you. And uh, wish you and the team all the success that are to continue to inspire people there. So, Thank you. Um, I should say, I was just hmm. going to mention that we are now merging with the Valley of the Sun chapter okay. uh, to us. And so we're in the process of uh, merging with them and name change and all that. And it, it's public knowledge, like other people can know about it. Um, I can't remember what we've settled on as the name or if we're still voting on that. But so soon enough, we're joining forces. And so uh, it, that should be kind of interesting. It's uh, we'll have to get a new logo and all the things. So it's, it's cool. Perfect. Sarah, so as an entry point to our random rapid fire question drawn or in honor of forward not the nutters round, tell us three things not many people know about you. Oh gosh. So let's see. I've lived in five states. Oh. Uh, I am a marathoner and oh. Three things. I should have. Uh, I should have done some homework on this one. And uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, I don't know. What would be the last one? 
I feel like I could have come up with better things, but that I am not great at knitting, though I love doing it and singing in that category as well. (laughs) (laughs) Doesn't stop me from doing other things, but uh, I'm not too great at it. Brilliant. Uh, So that's good. I mean, there's a lot to talk about uh, in what you just said and and a little bit more as well. So what are your hobbies and interests? Uh, What do you do at your free time? So I hike a lot. I'm currently Mm -hmm. doing a 52 hike challenge for the year and Mm -hmm. I just finished my 31st hike. So I have about 21 left uh, to, to get through the year. And, you know, and I count small hikes and large hikes, you know, they don't have to be, you know, scaling the top of every mountain in order to, for it to count. Um, I try to set some kind of big fitness goal for myself every year. And so that's, that's my current thing. And my son goes on a lot of those with me, which is a lot of fun. He's 12. Uh, we love to volunteer together, whether that's in person, uh, you know, feeding the homeless or uh, packing up backpacks full of goodies for school age children or during the pandemic, what we did to try and save busy since we couldn't do a lot of in-person stuff is we would, you know, make blankets uh, for our unhoused neighbors, or uh, we did a neighborhood collection once of gently used uh, tennis shoes and running in that kind of gear. Uh, I have a good friend who, this is a plug for her. Uh, She's known around LA as the brown bag lady. Her name's Jackie Norville. And she started this charity six years ago maybe seven. Um, and she, you know, the first Sunday of every month, she goes out to feed the homeless in, uh, skid row. And then if she has leftovers still Hollywood and Venice as well, but since the pandemic, she's out there multiple times a week because a lot of other charities had to stop feeding, uh, because they just didn't have enough volunteers. And so she, she did the opposite. She ramped up. And so we try to support her in any way. Uh, she's, yeah, she's does amazing work and uh, we'd love to travel. Uh, whether that's traveling with my son or uh, on my own um, and running and walking a ton. Yeah. Museums when they're open <laughs> and that kind of thing. And, you know, just spending time with family and, and we love having, since, since we live in California and the, ma- the vast majority of our family lives in the Midwest, it's, it's an easy destination for them to come visit. So uh, we love playing host and showing people around town. Perfect. Perfect. Tara. Also playing board games, watching The Office, Survivor, and all the cooking shows. <laughs> yeah, we, we love Survivor. We actually got to go to the finale of Survivor in person uh, two mm-hmm. years ago. One of our favorite, favorite experiences. Uh, we also played Jeopardy together most nights. And we got to, uh, right before Alex Trebek was diagnosed with uh, cancer, we saw a live taping. We got to go to two shows because it's like a half a mile from my house. So uh, that that was really fun. We'd only been living in California for like three weeks and we got to go to this taping of Jeopardy. And it was, it was total highlight for us, but yeah, we bake a lot and uh, board games. My son is better at board games than I am. That's for sure. He goes to like these in-person uh, strategic con it's called. It's a board game conference that he does with his dad, but we, you know, I try to hold my own. Perfect, Tara. Perfect. That's a, that's a lot there. So let's officially enter the random rapid fire question round. There's no right or wrong answer. Whatever comes in your mind, let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, what is that one childhood fear that you haven't told many people yet? Terrified of clowns. Oh, interesting. Okay. Are you still terrified of yes, clowns? One hundred percent. Oh my God. So if you could be invisible for a day, what would you do? If I could be invisible for a day, what would I do? I would probably, oh my gosh, invisible for a day. I would be on a flight somewhere because I love eavesdropping and, uh, you know, kind of hearing other people's stories right so you know plain conversations are always interesting because it's usually a couple strangers talking to each other so i think that would be entertaining people watching got it got it okay so if you're attending halloween party what would your costume be and why oh wow 
Right. So one of my other, I have a lot of nicknames. One of my other nicknames is T-Rex. It was just like a college nickname to be silly. So maybe I would dress in one of those blow up silly T-Rex costumes because then nobody could see who I was behind it. That'd be fun. Got it. Is there any other nicknames that you have other than T-Rex and Paralegal? Oh yeah. So my parents, my dad and my stepmom call me Sarah Lee, like after the cake company, because their slogan is nobody doesn't like Sarah Lee. Uh-huh. Fun fact, I thought for years that it was like nobody does it like Sarah Lee. I'm like, does what? I don't understand why you guys call me that. And now I get it. Nobody doesn't like. Okay. I'm like, got it. Thank you. So now it's a comment, but I didn't realize that for a long time. So to this day, they still call me Sarah Lee. Uh-huh. Uh, I had you know, strawberry hair. And so my mom would put it in like a waterfall on top of my head, like, you know, just like a, a palm tree, basically. So my grandparents called me pebbles, like for pebbles. <laughs> um, so, so cute. Uh, my sisters, unfortunately, found out that my name spelled backwards is a rat. Uh, so they call me that sometimes. <laughs> when um, so, yeah, I think that's enough nicknames for any one person. Wow, it's a lot. It's a lot, but it's good. It's all fun stuff. It's great. I mean, like, uh, it's super it's just, amazing. Yeah, it's a lot of plays on my name, like Terrible and Tyrannosaurus. I'm like, okay, I got it. <laughs> got it, got it. So what movie or a book character are you most similar to? I would say a mix between Katniss Everdeen from Hunger Games mm-hmm. and, and Anne Frank. Totally two super random things, but that's the first thing that came to my mind because I love to write and, and be thoughtful and, and helpful to my family and friends, but also I'm kind of one to not mess with. Like, don't, don't get on my bad side. <laughs> Definitely don't. don't kind, of a, do kind of a mama bear in that way. I'm protective. <laughs> so if you could change one thing about how the human body has evolved, what would you change? how the human body has evolved mm. I, the human body is way too tolerant for foods that are not pure you know what i mean mm. like i i wish there was something where it was like forcing everyone to have to go back to more basics and less processed food mm. wow that well said Tara. so is there any food that you could never bring yourself to eat anything that you dislike oh eat my gosh tons of things i'm such a picky eater it's weird mm. Like I've never had salad dressing or ketchup and mustard. I don't like condiments at all. Very weird. Um, doesn't mean I don't eat salads. I just put olive oil on it. I'm, I'm obsessed with different flavors of olive oils. If you, if you see me at a farmer's market, I'm like searching out the weird olive oils that have like grapefruit in them and lemon and orange and whatever. But I also have never had a pickle. So, and I don't want to never, ever. <laughs> Very interesting. On the other side, what are your favorite food? Three foods. That I you love, really like. yeah. love all seafood, especially crab legs. Anything mm. allowed to dip into butter without it being weird, like that's, I'm good with that. Uh, I've, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I love sushi too. Um, I don't know, Mexican food, pasta. Mm. That's good. That's good. My favorite dessert is definitely anything with like chocolate mousse or cho- chocolate anything like mm. you good with that i'm the chocolate fan perfect yes. so if you could visit any place in the world right now where would you choose to go and why greece it's mm. just mesmerizing from the pictures to the food to the culture i just want to like wrap myself up in uh all things grecian got it so what do you get every time you go for grocery shopping? The, the, that I get every time what? Every time you go for grocery shopping. What for grocery shopping? Uh-huh. Um, always fresh fruit and vegetables. We make a lot of uh, protein and, and smoothie kind of shakes. Um, yeah, every time. It's a proper healthy one, Tara. Nice. So if given a chance... You could just become somebody else. Who would you like to be for a day? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> That's very, very quick. Why? Oh, yeah. Don't have to think twice about that. Any reason, any reason oh, why? Any reason. Oh, my gosh. 
she's broken every single barrier that there, that had ever existed for her. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when people are going to law school, for instance, not only was it like nearly impossible for her to get accepted anywhere as a woman in her time, but they tell you not to have a job. They tell you not to, uh, you know, put too much on your plate. She was a young mother at the time, like having, a, a you know, young children at home while going to law school. And then her husband at the time, Marty, got sick with cancer while he was also in law school. And she ended up doing a lot of his work for him. So she was basically going to two different law schools while being a mom and mm -hmm. paved the way for so many people in such a humble and non braggadocious way. Right. She definitely, you know, killed him with kindness, if you will. And, and just relied on her smarts and her abilities versus um, having to like, awkwardly fight the good fight right she did it in such a graceful way that uh yeah if I could be if I could be her for a day a week a month that would be great I mean I don't mind being myself but but if I had to choose yeah definitely that sounds great so if you are asked to make a special dinner for a special guest but you can choose who the guest is going to be and also the menu what mm -hmm. would you choose who would you choose and my guest be you too uh-huh. Oh man. Well, Mariah Carey would be my guest because she is my favorite and she's so entertaining and kind of an oddball person. It seems like, uh, it seems like she would be. So I would absolutely make whatever she wants, but if she wanted me to choose the menu, I would totally make just a beautiful salad and crab legs. I think people get intimidated by trying to make something like that at home, but it's like oh. the easiest thing you could ever make. You, you, boil the water and you put them in for seven minutes and then you're done. So it's easy, quick, and delicious. <laughs> wow, definitely, definitely. Huh? It's classic. What's a dream that you have never said out loud so far? A dream I've never said out loud so far. Mm. Wow. I would like to start a nonprofit at some point in my life. It's something that I've thought about for years but never really voiced it into the world. But yeah, that would be, that would be nice. higher. Interest. And it would be more to help uh, women and children in uh, abuse situations. And I know that plenty of those charities exist, but mm -hmm. I want to do it in a, in a very hyper local way so that it's not like something big that's already out there in the universe, but being able to like cut out the middleman and, and be able to give direct help and care to people as quickly as possible, instead of going through endless paperwork and, and having them have another door shut in their face saying, you know, the shelter's full or we can't help you for another two months because we're so backlogged. Like, and I'm sure that's the idea of a lot of those charities, but uh, yeah, I would love to focus my attention to that at some point. Yeah, it's 100%. Let, uh, we wish you your dream comes true, Tara. It's 100% will impact a lot of people. Nice. So Tara, last one. So if you were the president of the United States, what would you do on your first day? What would I do on my first day? I would definitely be pushing for more early childhood education. Mm. That's super key into what people end up turning out like later in life and make sure that all the environmental regulations that we had backed away from uh, are, are now back in place and make sure that there's space at the table for people of all backgrounds, ages, genders, you know, sexes, all that. Uh, and I think our current president is doing a pretty good job at that so far. So I would not do things too dissimilar to that, I think. Mm. That's quite nice. That's quite nice. But also, That's... you know, really focusing on getting the U S back to being a powerhouse, uh, and, and keep our efforts more, uh, you know, with, with our own population. I mean, not that I wouldn't want to help other countries, but, but like, let's clean up, you know, as many messes at home first before we lend a hand everywhere else all the time. Totally, Tara, totally. That's beautiful. Tara, who haven't you met or seen in a long time and you hope that they're doing okay? Oh, I would say, I, I would say like, because I haven't seen a lot of people in a long time. So I wouldn't say I haven't met because I, if it's somebody I haven't met, I, they're probably not on my radar. Uh, 
<laughs> right? I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen my grandfather in a long time. I haven't seen him probably in two or three years, honestly. Uh, so, and I, I mean, I know that he's doing okay, but uh, I would like to see him again soon. And, and hopefully I'm going back to Minnesota in a few weeks here. So hopefully I get to see him while I'm in town. So that's the random rapid fire question round. Hope you liked it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about the people in your life. So who are the people who have been the most influential in your life and career? I would say that my grandmothers, um, all of them have been an influence in my life. Even um, I had a grandma who passed away before I was born. And then my grandpa got remarried the year that I was born. So I've considered her grandma in my life, but even I hear stories about her and how uh, similar we are. Um, so definitely admire her. And then my grandma on my mom's side, she was always, uh, you know, she was a mother of 10 kids and uh, she also still found time to give back to others in her community. And so that's always stuck with me. And, and I carry that over into my own life. Um, and I've had women in powerful positions that have helped guide my career over the years that um, I don't want to necessarily name, name out loud on a podcast, but, uh, they helped me to, to learn things like don't apologize for things that aren't your fault. Right. Mm. Is like, if something goes wrong and something that you're doing is what, as far as a bid or whatever it is, you know, own, own it and, and say that like, you know, we'll, we'll fix this and we'll make it right. But, but if it's somebody else's error, don't fall on the sword. Don't, don't apologize for something that, that you had no control over. That good that's very good uh, very good oh my god I, I just thought to let the message land for a few seconds <laughs> uh, okay. nice Tara so uh, who is the kindest person you know the kindest person I know is my son Jefferson mm. Mm. he has a huge heart he looks after the needs of others in, in a way that is beyond his 12 years and considers others feelings and, you know, gets upset sometimes when we're watching the news at the injustices of the world and, you know, has all the answers to fix it, even though, even if they're not that practical. Uh, but I, I wish more people could see the world through his eyes. Everybody needs a Jefferson, I think. I agree. <laughs> Pretty great. Right. So, What's that one personal trait you really like the most about yourself? That I don't settle. I don't settle in life, in my career, in my relationships, in, uh, in, in anything I do. I try to strive for the best and I, I'm okay waiting, right? Like, I'm, like if I'm not where I'm at in my career, I'm okay to wait and to, to not settle for the next thing that just happens to come along. Uh, I need a paycheck. Like I, my current role, I was looking for well over a year and I definitely had a lot of other opportunities pop up and it, you know, but I, but I put myself in that position. I, I, I got to a point in my career that I could uh, wait for the right opportunity. And, and it wasn't always that way. You know um, I was laid off for instance, when my son was a month old um, or no, I'm sorry. He was, he, he had just gone back to daycare. So he would must've been two months old. And, you know, I was temping at different law firms here and there and trying to scrape together what I could. Um, but, you know, I worked very hard to get to a place where I don't have to settle, if, you know, in, in that regard. And I, I don't just leave things as well, it's good enough or, well, we've always done it that way. So let's, let's just keep going. Like that's not a reason or excuse to keep doing anything in life. Um, so I, I try to push myself and push others around me to to always want the best. Brilliant, Tara, brilliant. So Tara, what's that one common myth about our profession that you want to debunk? Well, I think that a lot of what we do is simple but not easy. And what I mean by that is that you know, one, one common myth that I found for people who are relying on us to complete the work that they need done to win the deals and win the work is that they're like, 
you guys have done this a million times. I know you've answered this question before. How do you not have this at your fingertips, right? And it's like, well, because it's being asked in a little bit different way, or they, they put it on one line of an Excel, but it's actually four questions wrapped into one. And so what we do, uh, we're not, you know, rocket scientists here in, in curing cancer, but like we definitely want to be able to put out the best and most complete responses. So it is a time consuming process and, and we're cat herders a lot of time, right? Like, so, you know, we may have part of the answer, but we have to rely on our SMEs and they don't always get back to us immediately. So, um, so I, I think like a lot of our work isn't extremely hard. It's just time consuming and people conflict being easy with being quick. And that's just not the case. Very well said, Tara. Very well said. Tara, what's the best piece of advice you have received and from whom? So going back to the not apologizing for things that aren't your fault, I feel like a lot of times women do that to the nth degree in their personal life as well, too. Like, mm-hmm. like I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry. Even apologizing to your child about something like, that's upsetting to them. Again, if it's not your fault, don't apologize for it. Explain to them why things went haywire and in what steps and corrective measures you can take to make things better. But if you take the fall for everything, then people will walk all over you and not respect you. So I got that advice from um, a woman named Barbara that I used to work with. And I just think she's the greatest. Very powerful advice, Tara. And I think you know it's absolutely essential for everybody to just um, stand to yeah. the ground and believe in what they do or believe in something. Because um, at every level, there are people who just um, test your <laughs> stamina. Um, and totally, I think that this will resonate with a lot of people. Thank you, Tara. Thank you for this. Um, Tara, what's one thing you wish you had known when you were that 15 year old who, who was working as a legal intern or who was running your own company with your sister? That you should prioritize your needs as much as you prioritize the needs of others, right? Don't put yourself at the bottom of your to-do list and ensure that you're meeting all your requirements at work, but that you're also keeping up your household and your family responsibilities and duties, and that those should not always play second fiddle. Uh, they, they did for a long time for me. And, you know, over the last several years, I've, I've worked, done a lot of work on myself to realize that, you know, it, it can wait, right? Like if, if we all, uh, you know, won the, I, I don't like to say like got hit by a bus I, on the opposite. Like if I, if I won the lottery tomorrow and was decided to quit my job, they would replace me in five seconds right? My family will never be able to replace me. So, you know, giving your time and attention away from the office as much as you do in the office, uh, I think is critical for everyone to remember, especially in this like mixed weird world of like, well, I'm working from my bedroom every day, but I'm at home, but I'm working. What am I doing? You know, so uh, trying to have that separation. Totally, totally well said, well said. Tara, you know, successful career, beautiful boy, um, APMP events, um, you know, family in Midwest, uh, so many good things around you, Tara. So what's next for you? What are you looking forward to in the future? Uh, I'm definitely looking to grow in my current role. I'm working towards the director level uh, at my company, and I hope to have a, a long uh, future here. Uh, our, our company is doing very well right now. Uh, we're on pace to, you know, hire a ton more people this year and just grow our business. So I'm excited about that and looking forward to taking on more responsibility, possibly, um, you know, maybe other teams reporting to me, hiring more on my team. But then uh, also, as I mentioned, as you mentioned in the intro, I am hoping to get my practitioner this summer and, mm-hmm. and keep pushing others, uh, you know, to, to do the same. No, I don't know. Wish you all the very best on this. Tara, is there any part of your life or career or is there anything else you would like to share to the listeners before we close? No, I think we uh, covered quite a bit here today. (laughs) (laughs) I would just say, you know, stay involved in your your RFP and APMP communities. Uh, There's a wealth of opportunity to, to give back to others in the industry, whether that's being a mentor, 
uh, looking for uh, a mentor of your own. And you don't have to be on the board to take on, you know, volunteer roles or uh, I encourage, especially, especially encourage women to step up as speakers. Like BPC is always looking for strong speakers, but so many times it's the same couple people up there uh, at conferences while they're great and they know their stuff. You know, we, we need to mix it up, ladies. Like we need to get out there and, and, and show what we got. And uh, that's myself included. Like, I feel like I need to probably do something like that in the next year or two. Um, once my tenure as the events chair uh, goes away and I have a little bit more time for that sort of thing. But yeah, that's my okay. advice. Parting words. Very well, very well. And, and, and I love that close on this. You know, definitely. It's, why is it always the same people who have been talking for 20 odd years still talking the same thing every single Absolutely. year? <laughs> like the know. world has changed. Like bids have changed the way we interact <laughs> with BD professionals and marketing and, you know, sales and all this stuff and the strategies. And like, you know, there's there's so many uh, strong people out there that I, I feel like we need we really need to mix things up a bit. Totally, Tara, totally. I'm sure we are bringing everybody together to highlight at least in, on our side who the, who the next, uh, what we call the full stack bidder or the next generation leaders in here in the podcast and the other things. Uh, but yeah, good to have you on everything that we do. So thank you so much, Tara, for your time today. It's been an absolute privilege and pleasure to have you with us at Scribble Talk. Wish you, your family, your loved ones, your colleagues at Blackline all the good health and happiness please continue to inspire everybody and uh, stay healthy stay happy stay sane and look after yourself keep smiling thank you so much for having me you're such a gift to this industry and i i just love staying connected with you and your team so thank you for having me today <laughs> thank you Tara. to our listeners thank you so much for tuning in Please visit batchyscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes. If you've enjoyed today's interview, don't forget to subscribe, review, and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays. Pascal Syndrome. Signing off.